Good evening, children of the night. Um, so for those of you who have been watching my channel since last year, uh, you will know that in October I do a five-part Halloween series. This is the first video of that series for 2021. So I'm joined for this video by little Count Frankula, who is feared, terrified throughout the world. Uh, he will probably not stay for the whole video, but we're going to be talking about the 1931 film Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi. Um, so the film itself generally follows the same kind of storyline that Bram Stoker's Dracula follows with, I mean, obviously changes because film is a different medium than a novel and in the 1930s films were fairly short. So you didn't have enough, sort of, you didn't have the epic time and space that you would have uh, for something like, say, Lord of the Rings, where it's 37 million hours. Um, basically, the story of Dracula in the film is that a chap named Renfield comes to Transylvania to conduct a real estate deal with Count Dracula. Uh, who the locals are like, no man, don't go up to Count Dracula's castle, because it's vampires. And Renfield's like, psh, ain't got time for no vampires. I have real estate business to transact. Um, so he goes up. Stuff's pretty creepy. Like giant, uh, there's like armadillos for some reason, which I don't think are indigenous to Transylvania. Uh, there's a possum at one point. Giant spiders. So the giant spiders are creepy. The armadillo and the possum is just kind of weird, but, you know, it's Dracula, so, you know, whatevs. Um, so the castle's pretty creepy. Giant cobwebs, decrepit, etc., etc. Um, Renfield, at one point, uh, gets a paper cut, and Dracula's all like, hmm, I am very interested in that. And Renfield's just like, yeah, whatevs. Uh, and he casually sticks his finger in his mouth and while this is all going on there's all kinds of like dracula not being super super subtle about the fact that he's a vampire and he kills people by drinking their blood um so that happens and then uh they sign the paperwork for dracula to rent carfax abbey in the uk uh and so they get on a ship. Renfield being kind of nuts at this point because uh, Dracula has basically enslaved him mentally. Uh, we'll talk more about Renfield because he's super, super interesting in this film. Um, so they get on the ship. Uh, they go to England. When they get there, everybody on the ship is dead except Renfield, who's nuts, and Dracula, who's in his car. Uh, while there, Dracula basically starts, like, meeting people socially. And... Uh, he turns Lucy into a vampire. And then she just sort of drops off the map. Like, her being a vampire gets mentioned a couple of times, but people are just sort of like, yeah, it's a weird thing that happened. But, you know, we're not going to spend much plot time on it. And we're not going to devote much dialogue to the fact that she literally got turned into a vampire. Frank, you're stepping on your cape. She literally got turned into a vampire and is now roaming London, killing people and draining their blood. It's just like... I don't know. It's like she got a weird hat, is how they, how they sort of treat it. Uh, and so, Dr. Van Helsing comes along. And he's all like, hey, everybody, uh, there's a vampire around. And they're just like, cool story, bro. Um, Renfield, by the way, during this time is in um, Dr. Seward's sanitarium, which is their very polite euphemism for an insane asylum. And in real life, if Van Helsing showed up and was like, hey, everybody, there's a vampire, that very striking... 
uh, Eastern European count is actually draining people's blood by biting their necks, people would be like, listen, man, there's a sanitarium right here. Like, you can, we'll just, we'll check you in right now. You have a rest, and then you can come back out and be a doctor again. Like, people would not just be like, oh, it's a vampire. Yeah, that seems right. That that checks out. Uh, which is basically the attitude they take in this film. <laughs> so, things start going south when Dracula's all like, oh, I'm going to turn Mina into a vampire. And her fiancé, Jonathan Harker, and her father, uh, Dr. Seward, are both of the opinion that he should not do that. And Van Helsing is like, we must kill Dracula, but he says it in a Dutch accent. Uh, we must kill Dracula by finding the coffin full of Transylvanian dirt and driving a stake through his heart. And people are just like, that sounds like a cool adventure. We should totally do that. Uh, and they kind of do. Like, Mina is all, like, partially vampired, and she's like, oh, I'm going to go out onto the terrace. Oh, look, a giant bat that's uncharacteristic of this region. I should go hang out with that. And Harker is all like, no, don't even worry about it. It'll get in your hair. I'm just going to, like, wave at it and try and drive it off. And basically, Mina is, like, hypnotized by Dracula, and she ends up... Uh, Van Helsing sort of vampire-proofs the house by uh, putting wreaths of wolf, wolf's bane everywhere. But the maid gets mesmerized by Dracula. And uh, she is compelled to take the wolf's bane off the uh, giant door's between Mina's room and the outside so that Dracula can come in and get Mina. Uh, he takes her back to Carfax Abbey. Uh, Renfield also goes to Carfax Abbey where Dracula's like, I don't require you anymore and I'm not going to reward you for your service. I'm just going to murder you. Um, and uh, Van Helsing and Harker go to uh, Carfax Abbey and they drive a stake through Dracula's heart because he's just like, whatevs, it's daytime, I'm sleeping in my coffin. I'm not even going to try and defend myself or anything. Just like, whatevs. Uh, and then because Dracula has died, Mina is released from the spell, even though she now has vampire blood in her veins. It's not real clear how Dracula's death sort of undoes that. But that's the happy ending. Um, and then, and then Harker and Mina are like, we're going to peace out. You should come with us, Dr. Van Helsing. And Van Helsing's like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. And it's, so that's a weird ending bit where he's just like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. But there's no real explanation of why he's staying or what he's doing. He's just like, what else? I'll, I'll, I've got, I've got unnamed tasks that fall outside the scope of the movie. So, I realize I've been fairly flippant about that plot summary uh, in terms of the stuff that's going on. And and there are a lot of like weird plot holes and things like that. Um, but it's really difficult to overstate the influence of Dracula, of this film, on the way that we think about vampires, the, the pop culture image that we have of vampires. I mean, the fact that little Count Frankula has this cape and this weird little metal thing, and that that's his vampire costume, like, that's down to this film. Um, the fact that whenever anybody does a vampire voice, it's that Bella Lugosi, I want to suck your blood kind of accent. And he actually never says that line in the movie. Um, but, like, the fact that we think of vampires as talking like that, as talking like these, with the Eastern European accent. Like, the fact that we think of vampires that way is down to Bella Lugosi, because that was the accent that he has in the film. And he dresses in this cape. He's the one who does the whole... Oh, pulled my cape over my face because I'm spooky and mysterious. Like, that's him. The tuxedo is him. 
all of this sort of vampire iconography uh, that we have, I mean, obviously modern vampires um, in a lot of movies and TV now are much more like rows of, of teeth and they're just like, I don't know, scuzzy and whatever, like Spike in, in um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but that tradition, like you think about it, if you go to Party City, for instance, and you wanted to buy a child's vampire costume, it's going to have the tux set up, it's going to have the cape, it's going to have the little metal. And again, that's all about Dracula from 1931. So, like this, and we'll see this over the course of these of these videos, all of which are going to be about the the classic Universal monster movies. Um, one of the things that consistently happens is that these films shape the popular consciousness of what these creatures or what these monsters look like. So, and Dracula is a great example of that. Because again, Bela Lugosi is Dracula in the popular consciousness. Um, and so that's super, super interesting. And it's super, super important. In part because these were the sort of the earliest films that really popularized these creatures. But that actually raises another really interesting point. Um, somewhat tangential, I guess, to this film itself. But Dracula was not the first Dracula movie. Actually, um, Nosferatu uh, came out nine years earlier in, in 1922. That was a German film. And one of the interesting things is that Nosferatu, uh, Count Orloff is actually the, the character's name, so uh, when they were making Nosferatu, they wanted to make a version of Dracula, but the estate of Bram Stoker was like, no, we, we won't give you the rights or we won't sell you the rights. So they were like, fine, we're going to change the names and make some slight plot alterations and we're going to make the movie anyway. Um, so it was like an unauthorized version of Dracula, uh, whereas in 1931, they had an authorized version, which is why they can call it now Dracula. Um, but, like, Nosferatu is a, a pretty horrifying dude. I mean, you look at this guy. And then you compare that to Dracula, to Bela Lugosi's Dracula, this guy. I am Dracula. And you can see we've got dramatically different aesthetics. And it's interesting that the sort of sexy, suave, James Bond style Dracula sort of wins out in the popular consciousness. Whereas the creepier Frank Oh, buddy. No, no, no. We don't need to go over there. That's where the camera is. Uh, I think he's going to be off, but maybe not. Uh, whereas the sort of creepier, like, monstrous vampire that we get with Count Orlov initially loses out in, in sort of po the popular consciousness, the popular image of Dracula. And it's only later when we get really to the modern period that we start getting that more monstrous vampire who's like weird ears and creepy mouth and physically different than human beings um, so that's really really interesting um, and again it shows the impact of media on popular consciousness um, so I, I think that's fascinating the other thing that I think is really, really interesting in terms of the impact of an iconic piece of media like Dracula is Renfield, played by Dwight Fry, who's fucking fantastic in this movie. I mean, Renfield is super creepy and fascinating. I want a Renfield movie. Like, 
Dracula is fine, but like I, I just want a Renfield movie where D Dwight Fry does and says crazy shit. Uh, so Renfield's this interesting character because he is so enslaved or mesmerized by Dracula early on, and he comes to believe that he can only sustain his life force by consuming other life forms, particularly flies, and then he works his way up to spiders, and he really wants rats. And he promises several times to be loyal to Dracula, to be in the service of Dracula in exchange for a sort of infinite supply of small creatures to consume. Renfield is very obviously uh, put in a mental institution. Uh, as you are when you show up cackling madly on a ship full of corpses and you're like, yeah, I'm going to eat a bunch of flies and spiders and shit now. Um, but the thing is, the thing about Renfield that's really cool is that he also, that portrayal by Dwight Fry also shapes the way that we think about horrifying characters. So, like, you take his laugh <laughs> Why, he's mad. The, we see this laugh with other characters, other often villains or insane characters. For me, the biggest one is probably the Joker from the from the Batman series. Like Heath Ledger's Joker, uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker. These these actors, even if they don't necessarily draw directly from Renfield, they do what Renfield does. The insane laughter and the staring eyes are in the, become in themselves these sort of terrifying elements. And I think, I mean, it's a, it's an amazing movie. Um, in part because of how influential it is. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about Dracula that I think is really noteworthy. In this film, we never actually see Dracula bite anyone. We only get reports of it. And, I mean, Mina, supposedly there's two small puncture wounds on her neck, but even when she removes her scarf, we don't see the puncture wound. She reports that she had a dream where Dracula opened his vein and made her drink his blood so that she would become a vampire, but we don't see it. So that's really interesting, too. And that's actually quite a deviation from, from most later vampire films and TV. Because we almost always, especially in things made after, say, 1975 or so, and that's an arbitrarily chosen date, um, but, I mean, we almost always see a vampire actually bite someone. We see their, their mouth smeared with blood, etc., etc. We don't see that in this movie. It never happens in this film. We get the implication that he's going to bite someone. We get Mina's dream memories of being bitten, but we don't actually see it. And that's kind of a throwback almost to ancient Greek tragedy where you very rarely see violence staged. You get violence reported by messengers or by witnesses or whatever it is, or even by, by the gods, but you don't really see violence done. And Aristotle in the Poetics actually argues that this is more terrifying, this is more emotive than if we saw violence on stage. And so, like, even though Dracula is clear, clearly not a Greek tragedy, there's this element of here's how you build terror, here's how you build horror, is through this technique of reporting violence. Super interesting, super influential film.